I remember back when I was a little kid my dad brought a new game home. I was excited since I always had fun with what he played or what he bought. I don't remember liking this story but the actual gameplay. I thought hey, this game is nothing like I've ever seen and that was true. I have never seen an RPG as large and as interesting as Skyrim. Seeing for the first time how you had to kill dragons and explore an entire open world without any limits, the amount of freedom the player had, how cool the magic spells looked in the inventory, all of it captured my eye. Time passed and I forgot a little about the game. A couple of years ago I decided to play it again and saw that as much as I liked this game and how nostalgic at some points I got for it, it bored me. There was something about the game that just didn't captivate me as much. Maybe I had already seen it, maybe I had played it too many times in the past. So I saw there was a way to play with the same engine and with some new modifications to the game, like adding a lot of spells, adding more armors and weapons that are historically accurate to the lore. There were some that even added new quests, NPCs or a whole new region. Of course I'm talking about modding. The thing that can help Skyrim feel a little bit less wonky or totally change it by replacing UI elements or even combat mechanics. On my search for more content that felt like a DLC sized expansion, I came across with Endro. Before I start talking about Endro, if you enter to my channel, you'll see that there are no essays other than this one. Also, the rest of the videos are in Spanish. Welcome to the Los Pollos Hermanos family. This is because playing through this game and loving it so much has made me search for an essay on this game. Since there are not a lot of those, I decided to give it a try. So please, if any information about this is incorrect or there is something that can be added, feel free to let me know in the comments. Now what exactly is Endro? I don't even like to call it a mod since it's a fully fleshed game. This game was made by Sure AI, a German development team that had already done things like these in other Elder Scrolls games, like for example, Nerim at Fate's Edge, released on the 9th of June of 2010. Since it was dubbed and subtitled on German, the release with English subtitles didn't arrive until the 11th of September of the same year. It got an incredible reception from everyone. This guy needs to let me hit some cave tr uh, we still going up? Uh, okay, where does this end? Okay, I'm going, oh, whoa, okay, wait, 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 wait. Oh, wow, am I really, okay, what? Seriously? Well, that sucks. This was made on the Oblivion engine, and as Enderal, Nerim was a full story with original characters and a brand new map. I can't tell you a lot about this one since I have yet to play it, but you get the idea. They also made a couple of projects like Meyer Aranath and Arc Twind, both for Morrowind. The great thing about Shore AI is that they are actually building a whole universe within their projects. Also, they make mad restaurant people. Oh, they have bathroom. <laughs> Jokes aside, this clearly isn't a game that goes along with the universe that I've been talking about. And it's more of a project to help them continue with their next games, since all of them have been free. On 2012, they revealed their new development for the next project, called Endro. The Shards of Order, which didn't contain any gameplay or first looks, but rather a post talking about how massive it was going to be. Endero bases upon the Skyrim game engine and aspires to become a role-playing game comparable to professional game industry products. The continent of Endero is the stage for an extensive, completely new and epic adventure. And boy did they deliver. So, I haven't really talked about this, but as Skyrim, the last games have been named after the countries they're set in. Nerim and Endro are totally new countries with their own story. Endro was the sequel to Nerim, meaning they both took place on the same universe. Now, this doesn't mean that you play as the same character and it's just the second part for the first game, but that the events that transpired on Nerim carry over to Endro. I'll get myself ahead, but your character is originally from Nerim, and you can hear all kinds of people making comments about your accent or how things are back there. 
I actually love this bit that says, what we do here is fantasy for adults. It is dirty and immersive and there are no fairies, which is absolutely true. I remember playing this for the first time and hearing characters swear really took me off guard. Not in a bad sense, but I simply didn't know what to expect playing blindly. Fuck! He's the reason these fuckers managed to take us by surprise. Oh, just shut the fuck up, will you? That's just great. The fucker brought his bitch with him. Don't you ever try to disrespect Kalia again. I'm gonna kick the shit out of you! Of course, later on the game touches a lot, and I mean a lot, of sensitive and mature topics, which I'll get into as the video progresses. They released a list of features that included a new continent, different climatic regions, a modified scale and level system, a complex main quest that differs from the conventional story part from the conventional story pattern. Fucking hell. A complex main quest that differs from the conventional story patterns of fantasy games, companions and characters with interesting multifaceted personalities and self-composed soundtracks and in-game music. And they nailed those promises. Not like that one, or that one, or that one. Why do you come? By the way, the footage that you're going to be watching is my playthrough, but I modded it a little bit. That's why the conversations look a little bit more cinematic, and I did that exactly for the purpose of this video. So, just be aware of that. As you probably might have already noticed, this essay is quite long. This is because I really want to talk about the main quests and one of the two guild quests that the game has to offer, the Relata. Of course, I'm going to talk about some spoilers in the game, I'll talk about the stories that I mentioned before, but try to be brief. If there are any major spoilers, I'll let you know, but still, if you haven't played this game, you should definitely give it a try going in fully blind. Skyrim or Rendral? While you put me in a really hard dilemma, I'd say Endral holds more merit for the mind-blowing story that is made on an incredibly old engine as Skyrim ones is. Thus, I might say that I would very much rather to choose Endral as a better game. Walk blessed brother. So, let me give you a little bit of context on how you start the game and what your story is. As soon as you start the game, you are instantly thrown in a beautiful landscape, as seen by the sun rays and the vibrant colors Enderal has to offer. And on a side note, I like this so much better in contrast to Skyrim's color palette. Skyrim's colors really feel dull and grey, which is not a bad thing. After all, it is set on a Nordic region where most of it is probably cold. Enderal, on the other hand, has turned up the colors on the whole country. This intro sequence is just a little taste of what you're going to encounter exploring the game. You then get an objective. A nice day in the summer. I have to talk to daddy. He wants to tell me something important. I really like this because it's different from other Elder Scroll games or, well, other games in general. Instead of starting with chaos or storytelling when you can't do anything but listen or watch, you are thrown to play immediately. Since this is a weird way to start a game, you probably will be interested in this objective. Who is Daddy? And who are we? As you walk up, you can see different things like for example a burnt down house, in which if you enter, you can see that there is a book. This is where things get unsettling. It says that everybody knows that meat is life, and that when they killed an enemy, they tore out the liver and heart, eating them together with their family. You know, the typical family bonding activity, eating your enemies insights to assert dominance. Nothing like knocking back a cold one on top of your enemies smoking corpses. If you go to your left, hidden in some bushes, you'll see this. Three wooden crosses with skeletons crucified with fire beneath them. I'll explain this a little bit later on. If you go back to the road, you will eventually see a house and a person chopping wood. Meet Daddy. The first thing he says is a question. Did you find it? What we're looking for isn't clear. However, in these two options, we can see that there is uh, one that has this uh, symbol. Look, I don't know what this is called, okay? That means that the conversation will progress further and it's an option that will change what the character will say or the outcome of a quest. Where there are other options that are not marked, these are just lines that you can say to get a little bit more context, ask a question, or other things that will usually not advance the conversation. You can ask what is this place and where are we? He treats this question as silly, saying that you're at home with mommy, sister, him and you. 
He then asks the same question as before. When saying that we didn't, he says that maybe we are looking in the wrong places. He then tells us to enter to the house to help mommy with the cooking, as the creator essentially put an elk close by to hunt. As you're entering the house, for some reason you can hear this. Now I don't know about you, but this felt like some sort of jump scare. I really wasn't expecting something like that out of nowhere. Anyways, we can see that there are multiple rooms, all of them locked. We see a dining table, and to the right there is this disturbing painting of something eating another person. This is actually Saturn devouring his son, a painting by Francisco Goya, which references when Titan Cronus, known as Saturn in Roman mythology, ate one of his children after Gaia said that one of them would overthrow him. So it really sets the tone for the remainder of the game. Entering the room to the opposite side of the dining room, we see what appears to be a kitchen with a campfire, a lot of meat hanging, and the elk that it was talking about. There is a lot of blood on the floor surrounding the elk. As you enter, daddy walks behind you and mentions the mess he left. After mentioning mommy and sister, he tells you that they're dead. And not only that, that you murdered them. After that, we get three options. All of them mention that you didn't kill your family. It was the masked men. It doesn't matter what options you choose, all of them lead to the same reply of your father detailing how you burned your sister's crib and when mommy heard and tried to save her, there was nothing but burned flesh. As you mentioned that, you can hear daddy saying again, as if you had already had that conversation before. Not only that, but you can hear his voice starting to get tired of saying the same thing. It sounds as if it really pains him talking about this. The only option after this is the same as before. He gets really agitated and says, Isn't it enough that you murdered us? This is where things start to get really weird, so I'll let this play out. You know, sometimes I wish the creator would have made me just a little less merciful. Just a little less pious. Because then I would have realized that you were tainted by sin long before any of this had ever happened. And instead of raising you, feeding you, and loving you like a father does, I would have put you in the horse trough right after you were born. Yes, I should have killed you. I should have just killed you. Just like you killed us. And now, you think you're safe because we're all under the earth, don't you? Well, listen up, my child. You are wrong. And do you know why? Because the dead don't forget. Do you hear me? What I like the most of this cutscene is the contrast of how beautiful and peaceful the scenery seemed until we entered the house. You can even see that it's nighttime when you enter. Throughout the game, we will keep dreaming similar situations on the same house. Now, one of the things that the main character is feeling with this experience is the survivor's guilt syndrome, which occurs when somebody survives a traumatic experience when others couldn't, making them feel guilty. This also happens to events like suicide, which is a topic Enderal touches as well. Survivor's guilt later was changed to be called post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD that covers more traumatic events but is essentially the same. And don't worry, this will make sense later on. Then we get a cutscene that explains the events that happened on Nerim where seven arcanists achieved immortality through their magic. They ruled all mankind and only a century after that, most of mankind's problems were solved. There were no wars, no shattered lands. After this time, their human form was forgotten and they turned into gods or how people worshipped them, lightborn. Of course, all of this is explained a lot better in Nerim and you can actually help to overthrow the lightborn. Eventually, there was a group of people that grew tired of them and called them tyrants. The leading part of this rebellion was Narazul Arendil, which somehow gathered an army and killed the Lightborn. I know, I told you a little while ago that they achieved immortality. I don't really know what happened. I haven't played Nerim yet, okay? So, Henderal starts three years later, when all the lands were shattered again and wars started to erupt. But the cutscene says that this was merely a diversion to set a chain of events in motion. After that, if you really didn't cut it by now, that was a dream, so you wake up. Somebody tells you to stay quiet as you were screaming. Well, sorry. That was a bit harsh. I, I'm just nervous, that's all. 
Sirius is your friend and your companion on this travel. We are told that we are on a ship that sailed from Nerim to Enderal. Since the war and other problems were getting worse by the moment in Nerim, you and Sirius get on this ship, undetected. You snuck in and lived under storage with hopes of starting a new life. Now after a couple of dialogues, you'll get the chance to create your character, and you'll notice that all of the races say half, as your dad was from Nerim and your mother from the race that you decide to go with and the creator. After creating your characters with the four original races, which I'll not go into detail, you can hear that there are two people approaching you. Sirius gets really anxious, he doesn't know what to do until you both decide to fight them and knock them down. After the adrenaline of the fight, we can suggest a couple of questions. I didn't mention this before, but Enderal actually adds a system where some NPCs have this sympathy invisible bar, so to speak, that will change depending on what dialogue choices do you take. Spoiler here, skip to this timestamp if you want to continue without spoiling about this. This system actually allows for a romantic companion. The bad news is that you are limited to two people. The good news is that both characters are absolutely fantastic, lovable, and it doesn't matter your gender, you can romance either Kalia or Jaspar, but we'll talk about them later on. After deciding what to do, you are tasked with finding a rope. When you do, a veiled woman appears, talking about how Sirius isn't relevant and that there is a set of events that must be set in motion. Sound familiar? After levitating and crashing to the wall, or something, we wake up with the captain of the ship, who found us both, and she doesn't take it kindly. She mistakes us for bandits and Sirius tried to told her about the veiled woman. Kind. You are cutthroats. Filchers. At least have the guts to admit it. Long story short, Sirius dies and she gives the order to tie you with your dead friend and throw you to the sea. Another cutscene happens and this time you can see some weird places. You have these visions of burned corpses and hear a lot of voices. Tell me, what is time to the dead? You're dreaming anyway. So many people just talk, 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 and How never... How does it feel to be powerless? This is about your damn pride, team. I know I'm not a real man. At least not according to your definition. I know damn well I need it. It's just... Yeah. Christmas. There was nothing I could do. This isn't happening. But then again, this isn't happening. What is reality and... Selfish fool! This, of course, will really make sense as we progress into the story. When you wake up, you find yourself in this weird place with floating pillars and weird rocks surrounding you. This is an introduction to the meditation and skill point system. This is where you will level up, where you will spend your points depending on the playstyle you want to go with. After meditating again, you wake up in what appears to be an island of some sort. This is where the game begins. With no other option, you push forward finding minimal gear, fighting a few skiva, uh, I mean pit rats. So before continuing, let me talk about the mechanics of the game. As you know, Skyrim puts no penalty on you for healing as many times as you want, be it by using your potions, using healing spells, or devouring 473 cheese wheels. I eat all the cheese. I eat all of the cheese. This is not the case in Endral. And this is where the difficulty curve hits some players that didn't really pass the intro. I mean, look at that. Look at that! You can still heal by the methods I mentioned before, but here's the catch. Healing by consuming health potions or using a healing spell will increase what is called arcane fever, which we will discover more about later on. Getting this percentage of arcane fever too high can give you a lot of debuffs. If you reach 100, you instantly die. The lore says that a person that reaches 100% of arcane fever turns into an ore buyer. Uh, not the case. So this goes without saying, but it is highly unlikely that you will die of arcane fever. However, if you let it rise too much, the debuffs that it applies to you are really noticeable and will make you take in consideration this new mechanic. Then there's food, which can only heal if you are out of combat. Food doesn't immediately restore health as it did on Skyrim. Now it only helps you slowly regenerate your life. Oh, did I mention there is no regeneration on this game by default? 
This is why healing becomes very important and an actual problem instead of just saying, oh well, let me just wait until I recover some health or chuck three healing potions as if nothing's wrong. So there are a couple of items that actually give you short-term regeneration like carrots, cabbages, wolf meat, etc. And then there are long-term healing items which increase your regeneration for quite some time. None of these items will work if you are in combat, meaning if you want to heal with food, you will have to finish the combat or run like a coward, as you will do more than once. No mana. Yeah, no mana, bitch. You have no mana! Get the fuck out of here! Going on through the temple, we get introduced to arcane fever and ambrosia. It looks like there are some places, or specifically crystals, that can raise our arcane fever. We then see a potion called Ambrosia, which lowers your arcane fever by 20%. Now get used to have a couple of these in your inventory because you are going to need them. A lot. Since these are quite useful, they are not going to be cheap, with every potion costing a rough 200 pennies. Not every merchant you talk to sells it. There is another way of healing your arcane fever which is not really effective but the animation is really cool nonetheless. If you manage to get a pipe and some peaceweed, you can smoke it to reduce your arcane fever by a measly 1%. I still found myself doing this from time to time because I like that you sit down to smoke and it made your HUD invisible. It was great to take screenshots and immerse yourself a little bit more. When going near this weird cave, you get a pop-up message that mentions the ruin you saw in your vision. Going forward, we get to this water mill. After going through it, you encounter the first challenge. That is, if you go melee. If you go as mage, this is a breeze. We encounter a mod elemental, which not only has a lot of health, it actually regenerates quite a bit, and that can be a challenge to fight for the first time. After killing the mod elemental and totally not running away from it, you didn't run away from it, right? You're not a coward. By now, I feel it's important to talk about how the main story is divided into five chapters. One being the prologue, which you just finished, and the other four parts of the actual story. Finishing the prologue, you start with the quest A New Beginning, and begin Act 1. Now, I've been debating with myself whether I should end the video right here or continue with the full story. The main goal of this video is to get as much people as possible to experience this game for the first time. Ultimately, I decided to talk about the whole story. This is going to be one of the last warnings that I'll give before I start to talk about the whole story and the side quest I mentioned at the beginning. If you haven't played this game and are interested in what you've seen, I can't recommend it enough. Close the video, go download it on Steam. If you have any version of Skyrim, it's totally free. This is a story that's worth experiencing without knowing anything about it. You can come back later and tell me your opinion on the game if you decide to finish it. Getting back on topic, I just want to quickly mention that there is an affinity or class system. If you spend 10 points on a different branch of the skills in the meditation level up area, you can get different bonuses. For example, for the warrior stone, there are three branches, Vandal, Keeper, and Blade Dancer, each with a different way of playing. Say that you invest 10 points on Vandal and Blade Dancer. You would get the affinity Blade Master, which fortifies your health and stamina by 30 points permanently. Also boosts one and two-handed skills by seven points and melee damage by five points. There are tons of affinities, so I would really urge you to search on the wiki to see which one adapts more to your character. Oh yeah, there's a wiki, and it is official, on the Shure AI's website. You can find guides on, I think, all of the quests, how to start them and how to finish them, it's great. After you fight a couple of enemies and continue forward, you will eventually find Finn and Carbos. Now would you look at that? I knew I'd seen someone scrambling in the mountains. After making some small talk and even trading if you want, he tells you to follow the road to find Rivervale, the first village in the game. He gives you a health potion and says that your eyes don't look too well. After finishing the conversation, you will have a weird effect and have your sight partially blinded. This is the fever, and once again we talk to Finn about it, who notices we look bad and makes us a potion to help. In this process, a loud noise starts and we can hear these voices. You ask Finn about what you just saw, you try to explain what happened, he sounds confused until What the? Carbos! They've hit me, Finn. Do 
something, damn it! Don't go! Waking up, we meet Jispar, one of the main characters in the game if you couldn't tell when you saw him in the main menu. He explains that you appear to suffer from Arcanist's fever and tells you why you have this. Apparently, it's known that when somebody has this fever, they suddenly can do things they couldn't do before, like fighting or having magical skills. So we already know that this is true since in the meditation area we interact with the stones with the memory points, unlocking new skills like we knew them beforehand. Jaspar mentions that his employer might be able to help you treating the fever because if left untreated, things could turn really bad. He works for the Holy Order, a religious group located in the Sun Temple of Ark. The Holy Order follows Malphos, a lightborn and the previous ruler of Enderal. He made an appearance in Nerim and was slain by Narzul Arenthiel. Uh, whoops, spoiler. Before going to Ark, the capital of Enderal, Jaspar asks us to help him solve a mystery. Yero was a magister for the Order that contracted the Red Madness. It looks like this disease makes people perform merciless killings without a regard for their own safety, go on violent rampages and even affects animals that normally would be peaceful. Everyone affected with the Red Madness is said to have red eyes, hence its name. They also seem to talk about how the world needs to be purified. Jaspar needs to find more about this, so he gives us two new objectives, find Euro's lost strongbox and talk to a childhood friend of his. Opening the strongbox also contains a key and starts the quest Secrets. Now here is a mild spoiler for the ending of the game. There are three possible endings you can get, the third one being the hidden one, called Dreamflower Ending, which is achieved by quite literally drinking a potion. Reading information about the elixir, we see that the Dreamflower can have a drastic effect on a human, changing his connection with the sea of eventualities so the user can jump to the threat of reality that always yields the best possible outcome. The sea of eventualities is the concept of parallel realities coexisting at once, Basically, our concept of parallel universes. It is said that the only people that can see the different threats of reality are arcanists. However, it is possible that the meditation area where we level up is the sea of eventuality, so from now on I'll refer to it as such. After going through Yarrow's cellar, it looks like Yarrow had a dead body buried, which appears to be his wife. Jaspar then tells us that he was also breaking the law since the act of burying dead people was prohibited a long time ago and that everybody should go through the last journey, which is basically cremating the corpse and leaving the remains in a place the person liked. Boy, I'm glad this religion stuff is fictional. After finishing this quest, Jaspar says it's time to go to Ark. Now, since this game has no fast travel by default, teleportation scrolls will be your best friend to move around. These consumables will take you to different parts of the game and you can buy them to some of the merchants that you'll encounter on the game. There are also two spells, Mark and Return. When casting Mark, you leave behind a little orb that won't disappear. Return does exactly what you think, teleporting you to the Mark, no matter the distance. Going through the main path towards Ark, you will find... The arrow in the knee joke. You, you know it had to, to happen. I, I've, I've been, been waiting for this. this. Getting close to Ark, you can see on the distance the great city with a statue of Malphus carrying the Sun Temple, a gorgeous sight to look at for the first time. What? What? Not, not pretty enough? Ugh, fine, let me just... Yeah, there you go. Entering through the big door and officially being in Ark, Jaspar tells you to meet him in the marketplace while you walk around to get familiar with your surroundings. Right now, we are free to start taking quests from guilds or other side quests which have a good plot, like the first merchant you see to your right entering the city. There is another way- uh, I'm sorry, this CNB is pretty and all, but it's really starting to tank my performance and I don't want the video to look too weird all of a sudden. We'll just... <laughs> There is another way to travel in Enderal, and that is with Myrids. These dragon-like creatures can take you from one tower to another. Ark is divided into multiple quarters, even one of them being the rich people quarter. There are taverns, bathhouses, a marketplace full of life, a temple for the holy order, it's great. Navigating through it for the first time feels amazing. The city actually feels alive. 
as you hear people having a conversation or people talking to themselves instead of directly addressing you. They still address you saying things like walk blessed but you can see that the world does not revolve around you. But I like perspective. With good comes bad and the Undercity is the perfect example. This is the poor quarter of Ark. It is immense and goes as far as having a different hierarchy, a cult, and people on the floor begging for a coin or being afflicted with flesh maggots. This is no quarter, this is a different world built under the upper city. Remember when they said this was adult fantasy? This is the best example for it. Aside from the people consuming glimmer cap dust, which is a hard hallucinating drug, you can even go as far as finding prostitutes if you go to specific places. I mean, yeah, it's a dull fantasy, not the NSFW Nexus section in Skyrim, you can't do anything with them. What's wrong with you, bro? Exploring the Undercity, you will hear people cursing you. As for your clothes or armor, you look as if you were from the upper city. Which is partially true. You aren't exactly rich, nor you have a house, but you obviously don't belong there. You will also hear people talking about the arena, a place where everyone can place bets on fights to the death. The whole city is controlled by the cult Ralata, which you will be able to get acquainted with later on. But enough about that, let's continue with the story. Jaspar meets you in the marketplace and gives you some clothes. He tells you to follow his lead. Looking like an absolute buffoon, you eventually make your way to the Sun Temple. After a funny conversation, you are allowed to enter and you get greeted by this calm music. It feels like this soundtrack is telling you everything is going to be fine. In the end, everything will work out. Since you've already entered the temple, you have full access to it. You can see the quarters of the novices, the emporium, where most of the important discussions regarding Enderal happen, and finally, the chronicum, which is where you will be going to find Constantine Firespark, Jerspar's employer. Also from Nerim, may I add. After convincing him to take a look at you, he senses that there is indeed something different with your aura, it feels powerful. He then tells you to go to Lishari Pegast, a mage that can perform a ritual on you to help you control your arcane fever. And before going to find Lishari, we can actually talk a bit more to Constantine. Since he too is from Nerim, you can talk about some things over there and more importantly, you get to know more of your character's background. Ostian, according to Constantine, is a beautiful place ruined by cultists and masked men. He tells us his story of how he got to work for the Holy Order, and that he got tired of religion when the cultists and Ostian had crucified and burned at least 50 citizens of the city. And that's not even the worst part. They're beyond reason. Why are you doing this, I ask them. Because my god told me to. What's left to say there? You can essentially justify anything with that logic. I will refer to the main character as the Prophet from now on. In a bit you'll know why. The Prophet mentioned to be from Ostian and there is a high chance that the visions we see are fragments of past trauma. Also, Constantine mentioned the cultists from Ostian answer to a god who they refer to as the Creator, which Daddy also mentions in your recurring nightmares. One second later and I would have been scraping your remains off the floor. You stepped right into a Kyrenian dust crystal. No, those were some explosive ass grand soul gems. Meet Lishari. With short time for introductions, she needs our help, as some bandits have gathered to destroy their research. Apparently, her assistant was the one who helped the bandits to destroy what they were working for. You can let him die or save him, but the result is pretty much the same. He escapes or dies, but no explanation is given at the moment. After saving her research, she agrees to perform the ritual, only for it to not go the intended way and almost killing us in the process. She apologizes and says the ritual shouldn't do more than just a faint tickle, once again telling us that our aura is too powerful. 
Realizing something, she starts thinking and seems mildly agitated by the mere thought. She wants to tell us something, but since she works for the Holy Order, she has to remain silent due to a weird religious agreement or something. Reporting back at the Sun Temple, Constantine will tell you that the highest power in the Holy Order, Grand Master Tilor Arenthio, wants to talk to you since you've caught his attention with your visions and your powers. When talking to him, besides realizing he has an ASMR worthy voice, he'll explain that humanity faces a threat that must be stopped. To achieve this, you are indispensable. It looks like there is more to the current situation on things than the Red Madness. Vin is in a very chaotic state, the Red Madness and the wars being the most notorious difference as of late. All these problems aren't a coincidence, all of it is connected. Tealer is the father of Narazul Arenthio, the one responsible for the Lightborn's death. When he started the uprising against the gods, he also declared war on his own father, as he was a servant for them. Narazul won the war by killing everyone except his father, locking him up in a dungeon in Nerim. Only a few people of the Holy Order know that the gods are dead. The information hasn't been disclosed to the public as it would cause chaos and essentially make things worse. On Kira and Kilei, the rulers told the people about the death of the gods and thus started civil wars. Also, most likely, that's why their death is a rumor in Enderal. Probably people have left their regions and told others about it. Apparently, when Tealer escaped, he started having strange dreams, always the same dreams. They were similar to your visions, a burning sensation, screaming and blinding lights, and a bunch of magically talented people had them too. The Pyrians seem to be the key to understand why all of this chaos is happening, and one of the reasons why the investigation on Old Rashingrad was so important. Second, the history of each civilization unfolded and still unfolds according to a pattern. They emerge, they blossom, and at some point, at the apex of their existence, they simply disappear without any trace. We are part of an eternal loop a cycle, and our cycle is approaching its end. Each civilization has a certain time limit. Once it concludes, every living being ceases to exist, as the world starts again, somehow. We aren't the first civilization to have gone through this, and most likely we won't be the last. The most important question at the moment is how is it even possible for an entire civilization to disappear to understand how to stop it? That is the question. And there seems to be a pattern. Not only the same events happen every time, but also characters are always present with each cycle. Yes, the Pyrians call them the emissaries. Appearing just before the cleansing starts, as if a chain of events was set in motion. Healer self-proclaims himself as the ruler and addresses you as the prophet, both of you being the emissaries. Speaking of the visions again, we realize these visions are a way to see things that have happened and will happen. Our visions are the cleansing occurring, the flashing light, the burned corpses, all of them are part of a cycle coming to its end. Since we will need the resources the order has, it is imperative that we join. And to do so, we need to pass a trial where most novices gather to become keepers. This trial is only available to the most talented students, so a lot of people will have a problem with us taking it without even being a novice. And with this, we start the final part, Act 1. We meet Jorik Bartar, the keeper that will help us during our initiation into the Holy Order and clearly he doesn't seem too happy to help a pathless one to go through this ritual. How selfless of you, but as you wish. Ah, then it seems I'm granted the extraordinary honor of exalting the first pathless in the history of the Order to a Keeper. The others will scream for joy. <sighs> After handing the package Tealer told us to deliver, we greet the other students who will pass the test. First, we have a totally reasonable character, and one that will come to love. I don't want to hear it. You're prattling. I don't want to hear it. Just shove off. 
Dunwar comes across as a despicable character, and it's clear the game wants you to hate him. We will know more about him later on. I love how the game lets you say, as you wish, princess. Hey guys, I'm in and Al. Just hanging out. In contrast to Dunwar, we finally meet one of the most important characters in the story. Kalia Sakarish. Sakarish. I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I say Sakarish. Is that okay? Kalia is one of my favorite characters because she's a conflicted person, a mysterious one, and like you, she's pathless. After introducing yourself to both, Jorik starts the initiation. He says that all of us that suffer from arcane fever can get sick at the forest ahead from the spores of some mushrooms. And this isn't relevant, but there's a side quest that actually explains why the forest is the way it is. A failed experiment made the forest what it is today. I just like that most things in this universe make sense and happen for a reason. We have another vision, and this time it looks like Jorik and Teeler are having some sort of confrontation, but we don't exactly know why. Fascinating. I've read a lot about it, but never actually seen it. Poor thing. My brothers and I have seen the border countless many times before. But I bet you know all about the Undercity's rat holes instead. Yes, Dunwar, yeah, we get it, we are inferior, yes, my guy, okay, shut the fuck up. On our way, we encounter a suspicious man who seems to be doing something with a pickaxe. We get a glimpse at his eyes, and when we see he's afflicted with the red madness, he starts rambling about how she wanted to leave him, just like that. You will put away that pickaxe right now, my sir, and then get on your knees. She wanted to leave. Don't you understand? She wanted to leave me. Just like that. This but is now, disgusting. She will stay. By the righteous path. Have you lost your mind? I could ask you the same thing, damn it. Did you forget what Magister Yero did to the novices? This man could have attacked us at any moment. But did the thought ever cross your mind that one needs to understand a disease in order to heal it? And that some apothecary might have given their left hand for a living patient? This, you're not being... Uh, wait a second, hold on, I'm letting cook now. Like heck you did, you behaved like an idiot, and not for the first time. The other masters might ignore that fact due to your religious commitment and your bloodline, I get that. But if something like this ever happens again, you will be suspended from the rites and will spend the rest of your life polishing prayer banks in the sanctum. Do I make myself clear? Huh, I wonder what this is. Mm, probably nothing. Probably. We finally get to the first foothold. Here, we will start the ritual. Jorik starts by admitting the gods were dead. This isn't a surprise for us since Sealer already told us about it, but Kalia and Donwar had no idea, and they don't know how to take it either. Jorik says the Lightborn were killed by the sword of an unknown traveler, and then tells us about the prophecy of a shadow god that could end the era of the gods, which turns out to be what happened. Donwar is in denial. He can't see the point of going on if the gods are dead. So much to the point that when Kalia quotes a passage from the third revelation as proof of her faith, he calls her a witch and mentions an incident in a village. And though I shan't be seen, thou shalt live by my virtue. Third revelation, verse 137. I know it's hard, Dunwar, but if this is true, we have to show strength and keep on believing in what the Lightborn stood for, which is the idea of peace and... Oh, just shut your mouth, Sakaresh. If anything, you lowborn scum are living proof that the order is going downhill. Do you really think I don't know about the village? You're a damned witch, and if this were the old times, you would have been crucified long time ago. Shut the fuck up! No one cares about you! Know your fucking place, trash! After throwing a tantrum, Jorik tones him down and continues. We recite the holy words before starting the actual ritual. Now, you better hold on to your fucking chair, because things are about to get really wild. Now... Drink the potion I gave you. You first, prodigy. Let's hope the Grand Master was right about you.
Waking up, we appear to be in a cell block, and there is another person there with us. Oh no. No. No, no. I knew I wouldn't be the last one. Did they also tell you the tales about the Keeper's spirit? Meet Ixon, your fellow prisoner. Or rather, an illusion. You're right. I'm not real. At least not according to your definition of the word. But then again, what is reality anyway? If I told you that you and your friend Sirius actually lie dead at the bottom of the sea, and that everything that has happened so far, your journey to Ark, the search at the Sun Coast, was only a dream, would you be able to recognize the truth? The answer is no. Because you don't want to be dead. Therefore, your mind will do anything to make you believe this entire dream you've had was and is reality. <sighs> Doesn't it? Tell me, what is time to the dead and dreaming anyway? Are we really dead? Are we really dreaming all of our journey? We know that this must be a test since this all happened after we drank the potion, but the thought will always be on the back of our mind. He goes on and on about how all of this is a dream of your dying mind. You don't want to be dead, so you created this story because you don't want to die. He also talks about the suppressor, supposedly the one responsible for our imprisonment, and one that steals us from feelings and wishes. And he does it because he wants us to lose hope. Stop believing. If you didn't caught it, this is the same voice as Sirius, and it would make perfect sense someone has his voice in order for you to feel this person is a friend, a connection to the past. Suddenly, his attitude changes. He's no longer the poor, miserable prisoner he was literally two seconds ago. He wants to make it out of here. What the? How did you do that? You... You simply opened it? But that's impossible. All these years it's kept me from escaping and you just... To be honest, there's not much to be said of this prison, also because I'm not entirely sure I understand half of it. Like, yeah, it all happens in your mind, but there's a certain feeling on the back of my head that there's more to this place than just the hallucinations in the head. <laughs> Although it is important to mention the corpses with the seven sins and daddy's corpse, but it has no significance other than they're a part of you, I guess. Getting through, you eventually come back to your same cell. Ixon gets progressively anxious making it through this dungeon until he comes back and he accepts that he cannot escape and probably never will. I mean, what can you expect from someone who has killed his entire family? He tells you to leave him alone. Once again, this is a part of us. Ixon is probably also part of our survivor's guilt, so now it's up to you to escape. The game doesn't give you any tips or hints, you're on your own. Well, well, so you figured it out. <laughs> yes, I am what keeps you in this place. But was it blind rage that made you act, or have you truly understood who I am? I still have no idea, no. The salt corrodes your skin, and the water filling your lungs is cold. But you still haven't found it, child, have you? This game really wants you to believe that you're dead, that none of this is real and that you died with Ceres back at the start, at the boat. Is it our mind indirectly telling us that we are dead and that none of this is real? We wake up and the first thing that we see is a creepy statue on the table and right next to it, Jaspar is sitting there, like he was waiting for you to wake up. Everything seems to be relatively okay. You can ask where are all the others, but Jaspar mentions the entire temple was deserted like, that's not slightly weird in the first place. In the temple, the Curarium to be precise. You were brought here when you were traveling with that Ixen guy. I think the others are already awake, but I didn't want to leave you here, so I thought I'd just stay. How does Jaspar know Ixon? If you have your level of rhetorics high enough, you can actually ask this. Everyone knows about Ixen, and the fact that you're asking this shows how little you actually understood. You're pathetic, you know that? Simply pathetic. This isn't reality, and what is about to happen will confirm it. I said you are pathetic. At first, we believed it would be more exciting this time. <laughs> but now that we've seen the new prophet, our hopes are gone. You're a joke. 
a nobody who let his only friend kick the bucket. As if you'd ever accept that. You humans are always so damn persistent, aren't you? Why? Why can't you just let go? Because in the end, you are powerless, just as all those before you. And you, Prophet, you are the biggest joke of all. You are nothing but an urchin. A weakling. And a murderer. And that is why you will burn. This is our first encounter with the High Ones, the powerful beings that we will come to understand more about in a bit. They speak about the cleansing and how nobody can do anything to stop it. It will happen, no matter what. They call you an urchin and they speak about how they wanted to meet you and they say that they're disappointed. The world is an interplay of cause and effect and the only logical consequence of your existence is annihilation. That's the way it was and that's the way it's going to be. But enough of the banter, urchin. We wanted to meet you, and so we did. Even though the result is rather sobering. Now wake up! Keep on stumbling through the mist. Are we finally, actually awake? The creepy statue is nowhere to be found and this time we actually see Kalia and Dunware in the room, although only Kalia is awake. Thank Malthus. I was starting to think I was the only one. But it's good to see the Grandmaster was right after all. I woke up just a few hours earlier and he was here in the meantime. He didn't doubt for a single second that you would make it. Tilor fully believes in you and your potential. He thinks you are the key to stop all of this. This just plays a bit more on the scale of how things are. A lot of people are relying on you, including Kalia and Jaspar later on. The mere thought of having the fate of the world on your hands is something that would terrify anybody. I mean, sure, Enderal is not the first game to do this. But you, you are an exceptional case. To be fair, 90% of games out there have this exact scenario. Art, I don't want to alarm you, but the, the longer the icon of sin is on Earth, the stronger he will become. <laughs> But Enderal puts a twist on it. You take a liking to the characters and the world around you, and the threat you're facing isn't a violent explosion or a meteorite, but something worse. The extinction of the human race, the vanishing of all people and probably all living beings on Enderal. Something that even Galleon would shamelessly steal 21 years before. And the fact that we know so little about it is what makes it so good. We don't really know who is the enemy and what are we facing. Also, you can take the 13-year-old average Twitter user route and say that it's great that the gods died. Uh, okay. So, Kalia tells you that you both will take the Holy Oath in order to become Keepers, but surprise surprise, Dunward didn't wake up and at this point, most likely case, he won't. The apothecary examined him about an hour ago and it doesn't look good. It's likely that he'll never wake up again. Look, to be honest, I'm with you all. The first two options are my honest reaction to that information. However, hear me out. As much as Dunware was a complete piece of shit, he also had some weight on his shoulders. He came from a prestigious bloodline, sure, but he was the last of them. The last thing he had was his faith and devotion to the Order. Failing to wake up means he failed the trial, and most likely, he failed because in his eyes he had nothing else worth fighting for. His family was dead, the gods were dead, he quite literally had no reason to keep going. He is a brave character and deserves as much praise as... <laughs> I can't, nah, nah, fuck this guy. If you keep talking to Kalia, you will get to know her better, and we can ask what the witch thing meant back at the trial. Kalia has some sort of amnesia of her life until she was 6 years old. She doesn't remember her parents, where she was born, nothing. And the first memory she had was waking up in a village. The village was completely destroyed and its people were slaughtered. Some hunters got back to the village and knocked her out. A priest found her days before in a coma. She couldn't wake up and the people just thought that she was a witch child. After all that, she was able to make it to Ark, or rather the Undercity. A keeper found her and kind of adopted her from the Undercity, brought her to the Sun Temple and helped her out. As people aren't too fond of you being here, they weren't either of Kalia. You see, these people, as much as I don't like to see it that way, are fanatics. People that don't like changes and stick with tradition. 
Also, I guess it's for a status or money thing. They probably don't see pathless as people. They probably see pathless people not only as sinners but also a lost cause. That's why your arrival and sudden advancement to the Keeper rank on the Sun Temple has caused such a stir. Before going through the Holy Oath, we have to wait a day so they can prepare everything. And meanwhile, Jespar actually writes us a letter. He wants to see us in order to congratulate us for passing the test. We make our way to a watchtower in the outskirts of Ark, and there he is, waiting for us. So, before moving on, I actually love this and I want to talk about these quests. When the boy gave you the letter, it gave you a secondary quest called Every Day Like the Last, Part 2. There are two types of quests in Enderal. The second one related to Kalia, called Two Souls, which you might have seen before when talking to her after waking up. These are kind of... social links? Basically, each of these missions lets you get to know better Kalia and Jaspar. And depending on your choices on these quests, uh... spoilers? It will depend who you will romance in the latter part of the game. So. If you want to do these quests, you'll have to do them before progressing with the main quests, or basically as soon as possible, as they will go away if too much time passes and you'll lose the opportunity to finish them. Now, we actually did have one of these quests with Jaspar before, but I purposefully didn't show it up until this point because I have a lot to talk about and I'm very excited about this. So, when we finished talking to Constantine for the first time, Jaspar told us that if we have some time, we could meet at the tavern in Ark and have a chat. This is just one of those quests that lets you know that this world is full of life. And don't even get me started on the ambience sound. Sure, it can get repetitive if you stay too long, but it's still too good to be criticized. We make some small talk about being new on the country and how crazy it is that the day before I was pretty much a refugee and that our friend got murdered. And now I'm pretty much the key to save the world from an uncertain vanishing. Then Jispar tells us that he wants to go make a living on Calais, and he'll take a ship tomorrow since it'll probably be the last in some time due to the wars and whatnot. If you recall correctly, he's not exactly part of the Order, he's just a mercenary trying to make a living and the Order gave him a job. Now that he finished what he came to do, he doesn't see a point of sticking around any longer. Jispar actually doesn't fully like the Order, as he gives this example. You know. The funny thing is that a lot of times, it's especially those who think of themselves driven by a higher purpose who are the really dangerous ones. They don't understand what drives them, and that makes them easy to manipulate. So yeah, he doesn't have a lot of reasons to stay. And just have a listen to this, because it's the perfect example of a great quote in a video game that might be a bit of a cliche, but I can actually get behind. The world would be a much better place if everyone could just acknowledge that the only reason we're here is that we want to be happy. So yeah, not only you're able to know more about Jaspar in this quest, but you also know that he intends to leave tomorrow. Obviously, we know that's not true because we've already received the letter after our test that he said he wanted to chat again. So yeah, back to every day like the last, part 2. We meet Jaspar, and of course the first thing we ask him is why he decided to stay. He gives us some tobacco as a good friend would, and then we start talking. A few seconds after this conversation, he brings up a woman called Lysia, but it's actually spelled Lysia now. I think it's time that I talk about one of my favorite things related to this game. There is a full-fledged book called Dreams of the Dying, set on the same universe as Enderal, that tells the tale of Jaspar before all of the events of Enderal. I haven't finished it, but reading it has been such a cool experience. I love seeing Jaspar struggle through what happens on the book, which uh, will not spoil much. If I understand correctly, and vaguely based on his post and other comments of the people on Enderal subreddit, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Nicholas Litzot. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? The author and the project lead on Shore AI, responsible for writing most of Enderal's story and world building, among other things with the game, had to detach the book completely from Enderal because of some weird trademark situation. Apparently, the original creator of the region and pretty much the whole Vin continent trademarked the creation without telling Nicholas about it so he couldn't appeal. 
You kind of have a couple of months once this process uh, happens to appeal, but Nicholas didn't have the knowledge about it, so months later he got contacted by the creator of Vin, telling him to either detach his books from Enderal, or I assume to pay him either a flat rate or sh uh, sheriff profits. Nicholas will write his new novels as the 12th world instead of Enderal novels. Which, don't get me wrong, it's great and I wish him the best. After all, this game wouldn't be what it is without him and he's part of the reason why my life changed after playing and still reading about this universe. I don't want to hate on anybody since they haven't properly talked about this for a reason and of course we don't know the whole story. I think it's better if I let Nicholas explain this one. The second issue is the word Enderal itself. If you followed my novel project, Dreams of the Dying, you might have heard that there was a trademark claim that forced me to disconnect the novel from the games entirely. And for the same reason, we could never use Enderal or the story world or the universe of Vin or the characters in a commercial game. It's just out of the cards, because if this game were to become even remotely successful, someone would come out of the woodworks and claim their share, and Germany has a very strict copyright law on top of that. So, the good thing is, he changed a lot of stuff from the book, one of those being the spelling of Lycia and other lore-related stuff, like the consistency of the Illumined world and made-up languages he made for the book. So now it's his own thing. He isn't bound to the game, and he gains full creativity freedom. The only bad thing I can get out of all this is that most likely Endero won't see a sequel like Nerim did. However, in the comments of the YouTube video that I just showed, he replied to someone saying, I don't think Enderal is defined by the specifics of the world lore and the character names, as much as the themes and the characters, and fortunately, these can be trademarked. So that means that it is likely that characters from the games return on his newer novels. Could you imagine having a Kalia-related book? That would be so good. Please consider it, Nicholas. I love you. Well, back to the book. Here's a minor spoiler for the Dreams of the Dying novel. Lysia is actually a very important character in the book, and we see how Jaspar came to meet her and work with her in his travels. Along with two other characters, they traveled over Calais for some time, so essentially they shared a lot of time together, having a weird relationship between the two of them, one that was built mostly on casual sex. I love how the book portraits the struggles Jaspar had, his own demons, and in general gives us a broader perspective on him. This is your sign to go and take a look at the book and draw your own conclusions. Personally, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm enjoying it a lot, and I'm not much of a reading person. As for Nicholas, uh, this is his first novel, with another one in the way, with no actual date or release frame that I know of. I have no doubt it's gonna be a great book. And just for the record, I'm not sure if the novels are considered canon. Nicholas said in an interview he would consider them to be a spin-off rather than a prequel. Can't two good-looking adventurers have a nice chat on a beautiful evening without implications? But jokes aside, I think I know what you're trying to say. And as attractive as you are, I'm afraid I have to pass. Damn, I get rejected even in video games, dude? Fucking up. And that concludes every day like the last part too. I just love this game and love these quests. Jaspar is genuinely one of my favorite characters because of how much I resonate with him. And I gotta say, the voice actor Ben Britton killed it with this character. He explores and conveys Jaspar's emotion like nobody could. And on the topic, I would love to explore Enderal's voice actors with you all. First mentioning Andreas Wild, which not only did Teeler's voice in English, he also did it in German. And it was a surprise to see he has dubbed shows as Game of Thrones and other movies. Sadly, it was as much of a surprise to find out he passed away in May 2017. I'm a bit late, but I still offer my condolences to everybody around him. His performance as Teeler was stellar. Next up, I would love to talk about Caitlin Buckley, who did the voice for Kalia. I'm not going to say this for every single character because it goes without saying, every voice actor interpreted the role amazingly. But Caitlin, I, I think Caitlin nailed it. She portrays this strong yet insecure woman who has spent all their life being judged by others and more that we will come to see later on the story. As for the three of them, Andreas didn't do much voice acting on video games, only partaking roles in three video games, including Enderal, and he also did some shows like the narrator German dub in some One Piece episodes, but I couldn't find much information about that. Ben Britton has his own website, and he has a couple of demos you can listen to. He has starred in a bunch of games, and I think he has also done some commercials based on the first demo that you can listen on his website. 
And Caitlyn has her website full of work she's done for not only other games, but also various mods that she has given her voice for and followed for, Skyrim, and many more. My lover's heart is numbing stone that hides in ice beneath our sight. So some decry it is not there, while others whisper, yet it might. Now, of course, I can't keep talking about all the voice actors that did this amazing game, otherwise this video would be excessively long. However, I don't mean to discredit any of the participating voice actors of Anderol. All of them have helped build this amazing story and all of them have put their effort in making the world as immersive as possible. Do you want to know a fun fact about the voice acting in this game? It costed zero dollars. Yep, all of the voice actors that participated in this game, at least the original release of it, worked for free for the passion of it. In fact, most if not all of the game was pro bono, meaning that they didn't have much of a budget to start with and they did no money developing this game. But they did the best they could and brother, they did great. Shoutouts to every single person that contributed to this game and I am not even exaggerating when I say that this has to be the best passion project I've ever seen and probably will ever see in my life. I think I said it in the beginning of the video, but Enderal took approximately 6 years to make, which if you ask me, given the circumstances I've said before, had a pretty fast development. You might start to see why I love this game so much. If you've already played Enderal and it's the first time you're hearing about this, I hope this makes you appreciate and love this game even more than you did before. I certainly did. Also, you can hear the first chapter of the revised edition of the audiobook in YouTube. Help her. Say something. The full book is available on Audible and Google Play, which, surprise, is voiced by Ben Britton and Dave Fenoy, the voice actor for Lee in The Walking Dead and Tosh in StarCraft 2. He plays a role in Enderal as well, but we're still not up to that point. I did a $5 donation last year when I finished the game on a PayPal that, for some reason, I'm not able to find, but you can still donate to Nicholas on his Patreon if you want to show your support. As for Nicholas, he's actually working as a lead writer on the Gothic remake. It's pretty cool to know that most of the people that worked on Enderal are moving into bigger projects. Alright, back to the story. While we wait for the preparations, we can also do a mini quest with Lashari, knowing a little bit more about her. There's not much I wish to say about this part, but if you pay attention to her, you'll start to see a pattern. Most of the talented people that work for the Order don't do it from the kindness of their heart. They have a common purpose and that's it. But most, if not all people that work for them, despise the Order. Jaspar is a mercenary that doesn't like religion in general. Lashari has a grudge because religion took her brother and sent him to die in a holy war. Constantine hates religion because he's experienced firsthand how it brutally harms others. And the list goes on. After the talk with Lashari, Teeler finally finished the preparations for our big moment, the ceremony that will change our lives. It is time. Come forward, Prophet. I know what you are feeling. Mistrust. For it is the first time in the history of the Order that a stranger will receive the Holy Consecration. You consider it a treason against our charter, and therefore against us all. And indeed, it is true that traditions have strengthened the Order. We have ruled this land for millennia, and for millennia we have prevailed. And I know that what happened two years ago has unsettled you. Yes, we are in a crisis. Yes, our foundation seems to be shattered. And now you believe that I profane even what little is left by consecrating a pathless one. But you are wrong. It was always people who have given strength to the Order. People like you and me. Yes, we did serve the Lightborn, but because they embodied an idea. The idea of peace through stability. And even now, after their demise, we will pursue this idea. We are facing a threat that endangers the world as we know it. And to fight it, we need one thing above all others, the readiness to make sacrifices for the greater good. This man, like Novice Sakarish, has shown this readiness. He is talented and has a gift, and thus carries responsibility. But instead of running from this responsibility, he faced it and found us. Consecrated ones, 
repeat my words. This is the day when my old me dies away. For today, I receive the sigil. This is the day when my old me dies away. For today, I receive the sigil. From now on, I live to protect, by sword and mind, the path, my land, and those who are without strength. From now on, I live to protect, by sword and mind, the path, my land, and those who are without strength. Until death absolves me from my duty. Until death absolves me from my duty. Thus, you are elevated to keepers of the first sigil. Rise. Now let us all recite the holy words. Thou art my light, my glimmer at the horizon. Thy name is my sacrament, and thy path I will honor in life as in death. May, May your, your light, light guide, guide me. me. Leave now, brothers and sisters, and rest. We will need our strength. And we've done it. We are now part of the order. With this, we are one step closer of understanding the cycle and putting it to an end. Teeler tells you to get your official Holy Order armor from the Sun Temple's forge, and with that, we have completed Act 1. Before, we speak to Kalia to see how she's processing it, and like us, she seems a bit numb. So, yeah, it just feels like I've been playing and talking forever with this story, but we're just starting. Since we finished Act 1, let me give it a little bit of proper closure with my thoughts. As of now, we are probably one of the most important assets that Enderal has to fight the cycle, an event that happens once every couple of centuries. It wipes out all living beings and life starts over. We have met the High Ones responsible for the cycle. With a smug attitude, they have little faith that we can do much to stop it. Exiting the temple, we actually start hearing things about our initiation and how a pathless one is now part of the Order's ranks. Take a look at Jorik, for example. So, you actually made it, Prodigy. Congratulations. Even though I'm not sure everyone is as glad about that as the Grand Master. We can also come to meet Yuslan, who will teach us a bit of the magical schools that are available on Vin. Yuslan is also a member of the Order, Nerimese too, but we will know more about him later. We reclaim our armor from the Forge's Sun Temple to further confirm that we now are part of the Order. And with that, this is the end of Act 1. Well, I've done it. I've actually finished the first part of the Issei. This was mostly something that I started doing for fun without actually thinking of uploading it. Time passed and I fell in love with this project as well as with Enderal once again. If you've reached this part of the video from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. This is a first for me and while I have some experience on video editing, I've never done anything this long. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I want to address the elephant in the room the inconsistency on audio levels. I've been working with different editing software for this video and I'm not too experienced on them. If I'm honest, I've been working on this video for a whole year. I started to edit this video in 2022 and I'm just uploading it. I study a career and work a regular job so I've had much time to put into this video. Also, as someone with ADHD, it's been really hard to keep focus on the video. Sometimes I just lost inspiration and I didn't want it to become boring or dull halfway through. I think I did a pretty good job, but I would still love to read your feedback. Of course, I would love to make part 2, and it is my goal. Trust me, it'll be 10 times better than this video. However, it's probably gonna take some time. I will definitely do my best. So, once again, thank you very much for making it until this point of the video. 
I don't expect it to have tons of views, but then again, if it can reach out a couple people that have never played this game and will try it out, then I'm satisfied. So, take care, y'all.